and we're live. Leanne, so we're doing High it. Five. Yeah, hello. Yeah. Uh, hey, all. Stephen Shed here. I'm so pleased to be bringing Leanne Davy on today. Leanne, uh, a great friend, been a mentor for many, many years. Uh, Leanne was my boss's boss on my first ever semi-professional gig uh, <laughs> at a leadership consulting firm. And she is just wacky and fun and the type of amazing person that leans back at three o'clock in the afternoon and says, it's time for ice cream. Uh, Absolutely. And then, and then we do ice cream. Uh, so I'm so delighted to have Leanne today. We're going to unpack uh, conflict debt and conflict resilience. She wrote an amazing book called The Good Fight, all about how conflict is a superpower. Uh, and it's because it doesn't come easy to her. So we write books and we do the work that we need to do ourselves and give it to others to help hold us to account. So, so true. Truer words have never been spoken. <laughs> so we'll talk about that. Uh, please hop into the chat. Let us know that you're here and with us. We would love to hear your questions and comments as we go as well. Um, we're also going to talk about psychological safety. Become um, uh, both a hot topic, a very important topic. And Leanne, you wrote a blog on psychological safety, and as you so brilliantly do, it's a bit of a different take, a different perspective that we'll hop into as well. And we'll also talk about how we can take all of this stuff and relate it to helping to raise more resilient children as well. Um, apologies if I do sound congested, it's because I am, uh, but Leanne and I are both very, very appropriately and socially distanced as we're both in our home offices and studios here. Uh, but Leanne, I think that's enough of a preamble. Um, what's up? How's it going? Where do you want to go? It's going great. Uh, it is just that time of year where I'm starting to feel that I'm hauling myself to the holidays. Like <laughs> the, um, for me, I think it should, it should be spelled like H A U L I D A Y S. <laughs> oh, that's good. It does feel like I'm hauling my butt there, but I have a couple of weeks of really fun things, uh, some more client engagements, uh, an offsite, uh, this weekend, next week. And so things are still going, but definitely this is the time when I start to get into a more reflective mood about things. And so this kind of a discussion is perfectly placed. I'm ready to, and, and you'll notice I'm probably worn down enough that, uh, I'll be pretty candid. So this nice. could be an interesting day for this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we've we've got Leanne at peak tired for her to be peak <laughs> honest. This is very good. It's very true. Yeah. And you you just did your third annual November campaign. And I know you did a LinkedIn sprint. Like you posted every day for 30 days. days. Straight. So 60 days straight. And uh, in trying to really create better connections, use LinkedIn for good a little more than I think it has been lately. Mm -hmm. And the deal I made with myself was that I was really looking at connection, true human connection. And so I, I made the deal that if somebody commented, I would comment back with something meaningful. Uh, and so 4,000 comments later, <laughs> it's been a it's been a whirlwind. So um, my friend Dan Pontefract suggested that when November ended that I needed to celebrate me -sember. So mm. I have been off LinkedIn for a week. So I'm glad to be back. But yes, living some me is <laughs> nice. not quite as much uh, as much activity on the yeah. LinkedIn. I was I was assuming it wasn't going to be yes -sember. So no, it's, it's me no, and it's holidays. Me -sember. <laughs> yeah, and H A U L the days. Oh, yes, uh, I, and I I bet other people relate to the holidays thing, right? Just everything. So one of the other pieces I was really proud of this fall was this idea about it's not your workload that's killing you; it's your thought load, mm. and just like we can only do one thing at a time, basically. And so that's okay. You just kind of get busy doing it. The problem is when you're doing one thing, the six other things you're worried about. And I find the holidays are terrible for thought load because you're yeah. just thinking about, you know, the travel and the presents and I make way too many Christmas cookies and just all the extra stuff you're thinking and worried about. So yeah, um, but I'm trying to manage that more effectively this year. 
Wonderful. Yeah. So it's not necessarily work overload. It's thought load. And I definitely load, feel yeah. that like, I know I'm stressed because I, I typically make my lists by writing out on a sheet of paper. I know yeah. you have a really sophisticated <laughs> journal book thing that maybe you can flash. Yeah, my bullet journal. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I know I'm overloaded or overwhelmed. A friend of mine says there's underwhelmed, overwhelmed and whelmed. Uh, I know I'm <laughs> nobody's ever well. You notice that's not really a thing being whelmed. <laughs> we can be. I think we can make it a thing. Okay, How are you doing? Whelmed. Whelmed. Yeah, I'm whelmed. Um, so whelmed. Uh, but I, I know I'm overwhelmed when I have a day where I make my list about four times. Yeah. And I know I'm in thought overload then. And do you put things on the list that you've already done for the satisfaction of crossing them off? Dopamine. That's how you know you're overwhelmed. <laughs> of course I do. Who doesn't? Yeah. I don't. I don't usually add it on, but I do look at old lists where I've like, oh, I've done that. Shing. Yeah. Um, or when I when I open up my my reminder note in my calendar and I've done something, it feels it feels good. I just saw the note from Lori. Lori McKinney, hi. And so Lori was one of those people that I created that real human connection with as I was doing those sprints. So Lori, it's so nice that you're here. Yay. Amazing. So, yeah. so I think the the impetus, Leanne, was this article that you wrote that I printed out because uh, it's so good. It's a different take on psychological safety. Um, you know, you, you and I tend to get together for a coffee, hopefully a couple times a year. It's sometimes it's a couple times. Then there's a pandemic. Then there's a pandemic. <laughs> uh, so it was. It's been a couple times the past two years. Um, uh, but the last time we we got together. It was just before this article came came out. We spoke about psychological safety. I'll just take credit and say that uh, the ideas from this article directly came from our, our uh, wonderful yes. copy. So you you unpack, and I put the the link to this in uh, in the live. So if anyone wants to read it, or just go to Leanne's blog or her LinkedIn. A different take on psychological safety. So take us through it. You you talk about you know there's. There's real psychological safety. Yeah. Um, some nuances I've learned in psychological safety is you and I could both report to the same boss. I could feel psychologically safe and yeah. you couldn't. Yeah. Or you may not. Right. Which means, right. you know, psychological safety, there's black, there's there's white, and then there's there's gray. And the human existence, particularly when we get into emotions, lots of gray. Lots of gray. And so I'm hoping you can talk us through and if you don't remember the different yeah. categories i do i do i do it's okay yeah, but yeah give us give us don't a be that tour. person come on the show and like did i write that yeah yeah um uh give us give us the tour give us your yeah. thoughts on psychological safety yeah so by way of context um, my consulting work is exclusively with teams and so when you work in the area of teams and creating high performing teams this notion of psychological safety comes up frequently and we hear people talk about, well, I don't know if it's psychologically safe. I don't know if people, and especially when you're somebody who writes about the importance of conflict, people say, is it psychologically safe to uh, have diverse opinions, to advocate for something different than where the boss is going, or even uh, the majority of your peers are going? So this topic comes up a lot. And it's interesting. I was really trying to parse it into what I think are different phenomena uh, that are all now being labeled as psychological safety. And that's what happens when we create a term, The per like Amy Edmondson and, and some of the amazing work being done about actual psychological safety. Once a term gets out there into the social media world, it gets bastardized and it goes in all different places. So, yeah. you know, the first thing I wanted to talk about was the true concern of, of um, things that might cause you harm. So if I say something, if I say something different, if I say something uncomfortable, if I say something that people aren't going to like, mm -hmm. it's possible that I'm going to get yelled at. Well, you know what? I think yelling is psychologically damaging. To me, that counts. Um, I might be pulled off the project. I might be given fewer opportunities. I might be judged and seen as having less potential. And of course, the one we we think about, but in my experience happens extremely rarely, I could be fired. I can't say that. I'll be fired. And I'm sure there are cases. I've been working in this space 25 years. I can't really think of very many situations where someone's actually been fired for saying something unpopular, unless it's harassment or inappropriate. But, um, but th that's real psychological, a real psychological safety concern, or what I would refer to as danger. There mm -hmm. is some danger in that, that I will be yelled at, 
I will be um, taken off a project, I will be fired. So there is some of that. And um, it's really on the manager, on the organization to create an environment with values, with a culture where that stuff doesn't happen, right? That That's toxic. And I do see that as the responsibility of the manager and the organization. But there's two other categories that I think account for more of the culture of fear that we have in many, many teams. The second is not danger, but what I would call discomfort. So it's mm. it's the fear of aversive outcomes. So if I say something unpopular, someone might contradict me. Someone might poke holes in my argument. Someone might throw out stats and facts and evidence that disprove my point. Someone might make me do more work. Mm. <laughs> what a horrible <laughs> thought. Um, and, uh, and I see this in teams all the time. I see people throw out an idea. Maybe it was a good idea that people disagree with. And so there's some productive tension around that idea. Maybe it was a half-baked idea. And mm. people are like, what? you know, nah. Yeah. And there's there's some holes there. Yeah. There, yeah. And so, yes, it's aversive. Yes, there's discomfort, but there's not what I would call danger. Uh, you're not going to get yelled at. You're not going to get fired. <laughs> Um, but you are going to be uncomfortable for a bit. You mm -hmm. are going to be challenged, You all those sorts of things. And so there's a big difference. I think a lot of what we're labeling as a psychological safety issue and almost making someone else's responsibility is actually on us to improve our uh, arguing skills, to improve yeah. our conflict skills, to um, learn how to interpret people's behavior, not as personal, but as focused on the issue. So there's all that. And then the third category comes from situations where I've been with a team for months, if not years. I've been with them in hours and hours and hours of meetings, and I've never seen anything that I would even label as uncomfortable. And yet people will say things to me in confidential phone calls like, oh, don't, don't write that down. Like I'll, I'll get fired if anybody finds out I said that. Who, who are you talking about? This makes no sense to me. And and this is a case where I kind of think about it as you know in those old horror movies, the call is coming from inside the house. <laughs> and that that's when we are making up our own psychological danger. Yeah. And it's not danger at all in a sense. What it is is we have imposter syndrome. We need to be liked, and so we imagine what will happen if we disagree. <laughs> Um, that has no resemblance to what would actually happen. And so that's a third category. So that was the article was to say there is something real that is psychological safety. There yeah. is psychological danger for some people. It's legit. And we need HR, we need managers, we need leaders, we need cultures, really making sure that that toxic kind of environment is on the decline. And I think a much bigger source of this culture of fear problem is either um, avoiding discomfort or uh, just these tales we're telling ourselves that aren't true. Lack of yeah. confidence. Yeah. And those those last two. So avoiding avoiding conflict. I mean, I'm hearing there's productive tension and debate. Um, you know, and I and I know we'll we'll talk whether it's now or soon about conflict debt and the good fight because there's so much productive, healthy tension. And to your point, our influence skills and the abilities to say, I have an idea, it's not fully baked, I don't have all, all the data, but hear me out and help me if you think there's something here. Yeah. Or or know that I'm gonna continue to work on it, even if you don't think something's here. <laughs> um uh so that's that's like that's one piece. Yeah. Uh, and then the other is I've heard an acronym for fear, which is false expectations appearing real. Yeah. And whether it's it's baggage or it's something, um, uh, but it's actually and and I think you know it makes me think Leanne as well about Kim Scott's work on ruinous yeah. empathy, yeah. right? Of like, oh, I'm not going to share that feedback. Well, I don't want to hurt them, or I don't want to get hurt or be vulnerable myself. Right. And I don't want to hurt them. Of course, is in that third category, which is often I don't want them to stop liking me. Right. <laughs> right. It's like, right. no, not so much about me hurting them. It's that what if they stop liking me and I'm somebody who needs to be liked? And I think a lot of people in that third category, that's what's going on. I want yeah. to be liked. I want to think of myself as nice. Um, I hate the word nice. Uh, yeah, <laughs> kind find, is better. Yeah, nice is this apathetic 
lame. Oh, it's so wishy-washy. Um, and we can let a lot of stuff go by uh, in the service of being nice that if we actually held ourselves to to a standard of being kind, yeah. that we wouldn't let go by. So no more passive uh, apathetic niceness. Let's actually be kind, which is, um, which is actually got some substance to it. So yeah, sorry, that was a total aside. I just yeah. can't hear the word nice without like, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I love calling it, you know, very much inspired by Kim Scott's work, candor with care, Yeah, which is, you know, Hey, Leanne, uh, I got a thing. It's hard to say, but my instinct is that there's growth on the other end of this conversation. Right. I right. want to go there is now a good time. Yeah. And, and, and you may be like, you know what? Like, I want to hear it, but like, can I wait until Thursday afternoon? Right. Exactly. And I'm like, great. Can I, can I wait till I have a glass of wine? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So uh, I, I think, and you know, radical candor, the only qualm I have with radical candor, I think it's like the best book title out there. And I think the method is fantastic. Uh, I think, unfortunately, that lazy people, because I've been involved in a program where radical candor was uh, rolled out, lazy people just hear radical candor and go back to thinking it means they can be a jerk. I'm like, yeah. radical candor is a great book title. <laughs> I think yeah. it's phenomenal. And yet people didn't do her ideas justice because so many just heard that term and thought that they could be radically candid instead of, um, you know, kindly yeah. candid. So um, just remember, Kim's method is so much about both direct and caring. Um, yes. You can't, it doesn't, it isn't radical candor without both. So yeah, yeah. then it's, and th then she calls it obnoxious aggression, which yes, is, exactly. yeah, I mean, and, and let's face it, a lot of people read book covers, not a lot of people read I the know. insides. And of that books. term particularly, because it's so catchy and it's so yeah. good. Yeah. Um, people just thought they knew what that meant. And so I think there are a lot of people out there doing what they believe is radical candor that is actually obnoxious aggression. Or it's, it's radical asshole leading to more division. Which is so again, not her intent. But, no, and uh, not what the book says. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, which is why I like to call it candor with care. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, challenge directly, care personally is what she uh, encourages us to do. Uh, yeah. I have a question here from a good friend, Dave, uh, Dave Cairns. Let's pop it up here. Yep. Uh, how would you respond to a manager who packages up feedback as having your back, but in reality is a, or maybe I'll add in, feels like a covert yeah. threat? Yeah. Um, so here's the first thing I have to say before I can answer anything about feedback, which is that 95% um, of the population doesn't know what feedback is. So feedback is actually giving somebody new insight about your reaction to their behavior. And what most people, and even in, inherent in Dave's question, um, is what we commonly talk about as feedback, which is just judgment or evaluation. So the vast majority of what we're doing is not giving people new information about us and our reaction to their behavior. We're just telling them that we think what they did was good, bad, or indifferent. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So now if we go back to the question and now we say, can you put it back up again? Yeah, okay. Yeah. I can see it on the side. How would you respond to a manager who packages up? So I'm going to call that judgment. How would you respond to a manager who packages up judgment as having your back, but in reality is a covert threat? Um, you know, I think with questions, right, and trying to understand where are they coming from. So if you, and this may be one of those situations we were talking about where you say, you know what, can can I have a couple days to sit with that, kind of ha have some examples, talk to a couple of peers about what they're seeing in my behavior. So I, I would want to do some kind of gap. I wouldn't address that with the manager right in the moment. I'd want to do a bit of a sanity check with somebody I trust. Hey, this is the judgment that I got or the evaluation I got from the manager. And um, I, I just, I can't make sense of it, or I, I'm not sure it's true, or I feel like there's something um, that's sort of hidden, like it's a backhanded, <laughs> backhanded help. Um you know, what do you think? Can you give me a little information? How did you interpret that? Or, could, you know, what other sense would you make of it? So I, I would add an intermediary step of both adding a little time and then getting a little bit of validation or input from other people. And then I would go back with understanding, um, you know, how do you see me behaving differently? What would you like to see? 
you know, in service of what, you know, what are you trying to accomplish? Um, how do you think that that um, would change the outcomes I get? Like, I would just go back at it. Now, the thing is that if you're afraid, if you're in that second category, if you're afraid of learning uncomfortable things about yourself, it's going to be a very aversive situation. If you are not afraid of learning something about yourself that you might not like, then you go back to that manager with, oh, let me figure it out. What's there? What's going on? Maybe there's something I need to know. And if that manager is being underhanded, you know, they're not going to have great answers to your question. <laughs> they're going to become uncomfortable. And what happens is so often managers can dish that shit out and, and people eat it, right? <laughs> they're like, okay. And very seldom do those sort of passive aggressive managers have somebody come back at them with, oh, fascinating. I'd like to learn more. What's that about? You know, blah, blah, blah. And what we know about passive aggressiveness is that um, curiosity is completely kryptonite to it because right? the passive aggressive person is cheaping out. It, they're, they're not willing to actually judge you right out directly. So they give you all this backhanded stuff if you shine a light on it, if you lean into it and ask a bunch of questions about it, my my sense is and my mm. guess is for the most part, they're not coming back to you to do that again because <laughs> oh, you just I'm... made it, you switched the power, right? So I don't think you can do that in the moment. In the moment, I would be crying. Like, that's just me. I would literally in the moment, like be projectile crying. Um, but if I gave it a day or two, if I had a chance to call Shed and be like, okay, this is what she said, and what do you think of that? And how do I make sense of it? And how might I reframe that? And what would be some good questions I could go back with if I had a chance to kind of center myself and go back with it? Um, those kind of passive aggressive bosses don't come at people. Nice. Who, yeah, that's that's my wow. So lots take. there. So so <clears throat> I, I heard passive aggression is more a sign of insecurity. Yeah, it, for you know the old like it's not me, it's you. <laughs> That's one of those. It's not me. It's you. If the boss can't tell you directly that there's something they're concerned about and what makes them concerned about it, then, you know, they aren't doing their job very well. They're being passive aggressive and they're probably not sure. They're probably being triggered by you, their own insecurities being triggered, whatever else. So yeah, it's passive aggressive for the most part. So I love this. So, so take a pause, say th thank you for the feedback. Yeah. Let me yeah. internalize this. Um, or, you know, in, in, in Dave's question, it was being uh, disguised as having your, your back, but didn't feel that way. Right. So, so and probably go. wasn't Dave. Pro like, let's all be clear with each other. It probably wasn't. It was probably that manager feeling in some way threatened by you, insecure about you, or, or it would have come directly. Yeah. Lovely. Okay. So pause, take it back, go unpack it with a friend or yeah. more, someone who you trust and not someone who's just going to agree with you and no. get, and get into the like gossip party of, Oh, they're so right. like someone who can actually give you reasoned, objective, critical feedback, push you practice that, yeah. that aversion. Be questions healthy, like, yeah. You know, what might be my blind spot here? Right. What kernel of truth? What can I own? The seed of that, like all of that, those kinds of questions that make your friend feel like they're doing you a favor because I like blind spot because everybody knows that you would make sure your friend, like, have you ever been in a car with somebody who checks your blind spot for you? It's very funny. <laughs> so like any friend would not want you to have a blind spot and get sideswiped by something from the boss that you didn't know about. So mm -hmm. asking, you know, I, I really need your help. I'm worried I might have a blind spot here. This is the feedback phone a shed. Yeah. But that phone a shed needs a 976 number, I think, Dave. Um, uh -huh. So, uh, you know, asking for help to make sure that you don't have a blind spot is a good way to get there. Wonderful. Right. Wonderful. And then can you say this again, Leanne? Curiosity is the kryptonite to well, it's a passive aggressiveness, right? Because shining light on passive aggressiveness is exactly what they don't want. So passive aggressiveness um, is like the cheap way to kind of try and hurt you while protecting me and, uh, and seemingly I, protecting you. Right. And I, and I get it out with gossip or sarcasm or one liners or whatever else. If all of a sudden I get a whole bunch of attention back on me and I have to actually talk about something substantive about my point, same with sarcasm. If someone comes at you with star sarcasm, laugh and then be like, okay, so what's actually beneath that one liner? Or, or that was funny. 
uh, what aren't we talking about, <laughs> right? Nice. And when you actually bring attention to passive aggressiveness, who they don't they don't like that much. That's nice. very uncomfortable. No, oh, very good. Curiosity is the kryptonite to passive aggressiveness. Yeah. And the other thing I would say, anytime you have passive aggressiveness, you want to deal on both sides of the equation. So what it means is the way they've done the calculus is that it's safer for them to do these sort of passive or, or like tangential slams. So yeah. you need to deal with both sides. You need to make it more comfortable for them to be direct and less comfortable for them to be indirect. So I would be saying to the boss, I'd love to hear if if I might have a blind spot here. I'd love to. So make it easier and easier for them to tell you um, yeah. what's true. And, and if you get the sense that, you know, I think me joining this team um, has kind of changed how you interact with the team, you know, how are you experiencing it? If you make it easier for them to be direct, and then when they come at you with the indirect, if you just don't let them away with it. If yeah. You just, hey, yeah. You know, tell me more. What do you mean by that? I feel there's some truth in there. Like yeah, not, exactly. Yeah, not give them a hall pass on those microaggressions. Exactly. Oh, very good. Oh, very good. Okay. So for all those following <laughs> at home or office, I think it's so take a look, a different take on psychological safety. It's on LinkedIn. It's on Leanne's blog, but just to, to categorize these. So fear of harmful outcomes, fear of aversive outcomes. And there was one more. Why am I missing it? That's the, your own. Those are the two. So no, the, there's the third. The third one is like your own narrative, like the, um, the oh, policy. not not safe from yourself, right? When we're not yeah. safe from ourselves. Yeah. So legitimate psychological safety issues is there's a legitimate fear of harmful outcomes, yeah, danger. That's the yeah. first one. Yeah, Number which two, is discomfort. Yeah, which is which is rarer than we want to admit. Um, and remember, this is our amygdala. This is our lizard brain <laughs> saying there's a saber toothed tiger in front of you. There isn't a saber toothed tiger. Um, fear of aversive outcomes. That's a growth edge. Yeah. Um, and, and I love what you just took us through, Leah, and of, of pausing, like, you know, if, if something aversive happens, say, oh, I'm going to reflect on this and come back to you in our next one. -on -one. Don't expect yourself to be some like superhuman person that in the moment can hear something hurtful and then come back with some measured, open-ended question, curious response. Like, pfft. Maybe you can do that. I know I can't. So I don't ask anybody else to take a pause, take yeah. a beat, get some, you know, get some sleep and get some validation and some help and some reframing. Then, then it's a reasonable ask. Yes. And then finally, not safe from yourself. Uh, and, and this one's really hard because, you know, step one is admit you have a problem. And I think it, it takes someone getting to the point of, oh, wow, I have enough self-awareness here to realize that I'm actually getting in my own way here um, and that there's some work I need to do, whether that's one-on-one -on -one coach, therapy, whatever it might be. Yeah. Uh, but that's, you know, work to be done there because there's baggage that you're, you're bringing. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, 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 um. So, I mean, oh, Hi, here. Dave. Oh, bye, Dave. See you, buddy. Um, here's a question I have for you because you might actually have, you might push it. So I, I've been saying that feedback isn't fact, feedback is opinion. Yeah. Do, is that a statement that you agree with? Yes. So that I, yes, 100%. Um, I where I'm going, right. <laughs> as if I'm the arbiter of right. <laughs> um, what I've been talking about is great feedback is about two truths. That's how two, I talk about Two truths? Two truths. Yeah. So the first thing you do is, so first of all, we don't have the desire to give somebody feedback unless we're judging them. And that judgment may be a positive judgment. Oh my God, Shed, you're the, like the best LinkedIn live host ever. So that's judgment. Um, although I'm sure you may have the evidence that it's true, but <laughs> I'm um, not try and prove it. <laughs> judgment, <laughs> <Keep going. laughs> um, or, or, you know, a negative judgment. So when we're judging someone, that's when we want to give feedback. If we're just like observing someone, there's no compelling reason to give them feedback. So we start with a judgment. What we want to do is translate from judgment to behavior. What was it that he did that made this LinkedIn Live so much more engaging, so much more interesting, got more people signing on, more people asking questions? Oh, it was whatever. What was the behavior? 
Um, it was, you know, bringing some of the comments onto the screen. It was calling out people who are with us in the conversation by name. And, and so translating to behavior. So far in the feedback, there should be zero that's new information to you. I should be saying these things about your behavior and you're going like, yep, I did pull the comment on. Yep. I did. Then what you want is to share your truth. Mm. So my reaction to when you did that was, I just felt like it wasn't salesy. It wasn't schmarmy. It was like, we were just having a chat with cool people on LinkedIn. And that just felt so refreshing. Mm. So I can share my truth. But then the key thing about great feedback is that I but pass the baton so I can ask you about your truth. And of course, it's not as easy to do it in the positive example. But if you're giving, if you're judging someone negatively, and then you describe their behavior and tell them how. So the one I love during COVID is this, and, and I, I bet everybody's going to relate to this. You're about to give an important presentation in a meeting over Zoom or WebEx or whatever. And right as you start your presentation, Sally turns off her camera. And you're like, what the Sally? Like, oh, I'm like not interested in my presentation. And all of a sudden you start telling yourself some awesome story about what a bitch Sally is. And so if you were to give Sally feedback later, what you'd want to say is, Sally, in our meeting this morning, just orient her to what you're talking about, then translate from the judgment. What was it that made me feel Sally was rude? Oh, it was when she turned off her camera. Um, so I want to say that when we're in the meeting this morning and I started my presentation and you turned off your camera, so no new information yet. The new information is, I started telling myself this whole story about how my presentation wasn't interesting or how you as a really important stakeholder were, were not engaged and it kind of got me off track. So now I've told Sally my truth, but the key thing is, and this example is such a perfect one for this. The thing is I better be interested in Sally's truth, yeah. not just my truth. So I go, what was going on, Sally? And Sally goes, um, my kid's uh, school just got quarantined from COVID. And, you know, all of a sudden in the middle of the workday, she's just arrived home and she just came running on screen. So I just hit, hit the camera and mute as fast as I could. Um, I didn't want I didn't want her to interrupt everyone listening to your presentation. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, that was so not the story that I was telling myself. So great feedback is you know, translating away from judgment into behavior so that you can use, share your truth mm -hmm. about the experience and your response mm -hmm. and invite them to share their truth. Only when you get both truths, two truths in the situation, then you can say, okay, that was a great feedback experience. So that's, nice. that's how I, <laughs> Tina, I know Sally, yeah. Sally turning off her camera. Can you believe it? Um, yeah. So Courtney's, saying what I'm saying, which is that, you know, so often we deliver feedback like a bombing raid. Um, we're really uncomfortable about delivering feedback. So we just kind of like run, say the thing, and then like get out of there as fast as you can. And if you take the bombing raid metaphor, um, first of all, you usually stay at such a high altitude, you don't know if it landed. Um, normally someone coming out of nowhere and dropping a bomb on you and continuing to go does not make you feel like they're your ally for the most part. <laughs> and it's very likely to, uh, trigger a counter attack. So it is not a good strategy. You want to actually kind of go into it saying, Hey, I have some truth. I want to share with you about how I reacted to your behavior, but then I'd like to understand what, what was your truth. And so that's feedback. Pretty much everything that we deliver that we call feedback is just judgment mm. and evaluation. And we shouldn't be combining feedback and evaluation. They are two very different things. And, and I think we'd have better psychological safety to do a callback if we could have better, clearer, cleaner feedback separated from evaluation. And, and right now in our talent management and performance management practices, we tend to mush them together. Yeah. And I, I like to say, if you're getting to a formal performance review and feedback is being shared for the first time, that's a surprise. That's on you as a leader. Oh yeah. Like, that's just bad. Yeah. Bad. We need to create rituals such that it's happening frequently and it isn't scary. And it's, and I also like to say, Leanne, feedback is a dish best served. Because if you're only dishing it out and not receiving it back yourself, right. you might find out that your dish doesn't taste so good. Yeah, well, feedback, great feedback is a dinner party. 
right? Like there, there's, it goes in both directions. It's a dialogue. It's not a monologue. And so, you know, it, it's a horrible visceral image to say we deliver most feedback like a bombing raid. But as soon as I say that people go, oh crap, I, I am kind of, you know, dropping bombs and I keep flying as opposed to stopping to hear what was their, what was their truth. So yeah, it's, it's one of the biggest things we could do to improve psychological safety is to parse out the evaluation and judgment and and give people better feedback which is subjective information about us yes beautiful and i so it, it aligns nicely I, I have a formula for feedback which is fbi yeah i think so feeling behavior impact i think yeah. it, it you know i think it it the, the feeling is judgment belief uh the behavior is the behavior what specifically happened to give me i'm owning my feeling yeah and then the impact of it and then and then i think leanne to your point you know my truth plus your truth equals higher truth yeah, exactly. Which yeah, is what you're going curiosity. for. And, well, and it also, it equals understanding. And so the other thing is it goes right back to one of the quotes I love in the good fight is by definition, you, you can't communicate to someone. You can only communicate with them because communicate comes from the word commune to make common. And so often, uh, you know, I hear people all the time saying like, oh yeah, I, I already communicated that. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, no, you transmitted it. But if you didn't, if it was not two way, you don't know if you made common. <laughs> so okay. you have not communicated. So great feedback, the end of great feedback is when you've made common, you've come to a common understanding of this is, this was my behavior. This was how it landed. And then this was where it came from, or this was how I experienced it. There are two truths involved and that's how you make common. That's how you actually communicate. So you can't communicate to someone. You can only communicate with them. Love that. Love that. Uh, we have a common colleague, Amy, here, and Amy has asked, hey, Amy, any tips to ensure you're being supportive and maintaining a safe environment when asking for, for change? So perhaps in a difficult conversation, looking to see some change in, in behavior, what thoughts come to mind here for you? Liz? Yeah, so a, a couple things that I use in my facilitation, because pretty much any time that I'm facilitating, there's some kind of change we're looking for. So um, one of the big things I find is that we tend to anchor our request for change in the present, which which leads me to then believe, oh, I must be doing it wrong. Uh, if, if I need to change something, I must be doing it wrong. I like to anchor change in the future and I like to anchor change outside of the individual, preferably outside the team, the organization. <laughs> Um, and so I like to start change conversations with what's changing in the world? What are some of the macro environmental changes? What's different? How is the world changing? And then going to a question around what are the implications of that for the value we need to add or for what the business is counting on us to deliver? And in, in doing that conversation, what you're doing is not saying that anything you're doing today is wrong instead and, and not creating or triggering that defensiveness or that judgment. But instead, you're saying, how is the world changing? So how are we going to need to evolve? And so it's a very different psychological process. So we're back to psychological safety again. Yeah. To say not that, well, you're doing it all wrong. But instead to say, to start this conversation and have them draw some of their own conclusions about what's going to need to look differently. So you might have somebody who's a really methodical, slow decision maker, and you're just feeling like we have really got to increase the pace at which you're making decisions or the um, get away from how much gray area you are seeing. But instead of saying you're way too slow, <laughs> you could say things like, you know, how is the like, how is the environment changing, getting into a conversation about the pace of change, the, you know, one of the ones I think about all the time is I work with a lot of tech companies that used to be in a standard product development method, and now they've moved to agile. So they went from like releasing new products twice a year to two weeks, two week cycles and sprints. And so just saying something like, how do you think agile is changing the way we need to make decisions in the organization or that kind of a conversation, which is not as personal, not as um, vulnerable and, and then kind of saying, okay, so what, you know, what does it mean for you? What, and, and again, letting them try to answer. And, mm -hmm. and if they aren't nailing what you're thinking about, you can help them 
with, you know, one of the things I'm thinking about is how quickly we're going to have to make some of these calls. Or I'm thinking we might need to have two different categories of decisions. I love Amazon talks about one-way doors and two-way doors. Um, if it's a one-way door, we're going to need to use your kind of decision-making mode and being very cautious and whatever. If it's a two-way door that we could reverse that decision, you know, how might that change our willingness to take risk? How might that change the, what our decision process looks like? So uh, that's how I come at change, less about judging the person today, more about honoring that the way they're behaving is probably what was required and fit for purpose for the world they've been operating in. Bring the conversation both from the future and from outside. Um, use questions in a coaching kind of um, process to, um, you know, kind of draw their attention to some things that you might want to change. It just allows people to kind of preserve their um, pride, ego, <laughs> which yeah, dignity, you know, yeah, tends to, yeah, it tends to be a better kind of reaction. I love that. That's yeah. great, Leanne. Um, I, I think there's there's two things. One is when there's change steeped in, you know, the organization is shifting and changing, and we need to change the way we work to meet yeah. where the business needs to go. Yeah. Um. Uh. I saw a, a CEO do this brilliantly last week, where he set forth some some very you know with context. He yeah. sets forth some very aggressive but meaningful targets for his leadership team. And then, um, but he also included there is it wasn't time bound. Yeah. And then, and then what his team did was they went two and a half, three years. Like they raised their hands and said, I think we can do that in two and a half. Right. Three years. He let them he have let them, that sort of yeah. empowerment and autonomy. Yeah. He didn't yeah. tell them. I think yeah. he, I think the other one to Amy's question is if someone is behaving in ways that are counter to the values, which I think yeah, is so a that, different conversation. That's a different conversation. I, I would still come at it from outside of them as much as possible. So talking about what's the kind of culture we need, what's the kind of team we're trying to create, uh, what's the behavior we're looking for. So we have a lot of good data around how trust is important to productivity. It's important for a whole lot of reasons. Turns out the cool mechanism uh, that makes trust linked to productivity is that we take more uh, personal risk when we trust somebody. And those personal risks like having conflict, like sharing feedback, like working without a, you know, equitable sort of contracting of work, all those things that are what helps. So if you come from, you know, what do we need the culture in our team to be? What kind of trust do we need to be able to move at the speed we need to, to go at? And then, you know, what are some of the things that you, you think you can do that would help your teammates trust you more? What would help you trust them more? Um, you know, mm -hmm. how do we get some of those pro-social behaviors kind of going on? I would still come at it from outside of them because if you just go in with like, so you're a bit of a jerk, eh? <laughs> like who, who changes in response to that? We dig in. Yeah. It's too um, aversive in the second category of psychological safety. It might be true, but it we can't take that on board without having to feel badly about ourselves, which most of us don't want to do. So if again, it's like, oh, you know, I hadn't really thought about how, you know, always going to the same two or three people is making other people feel I don't trust them, which is slowing us down. I hadn't really thought about that. Okay. Uh, you know, I need to behave differently. So I still, no matter what, wherever possible, this is the psychologist in me, right? I'm trying to come at it with some psychological safety by allowing them to see it first sort of outside as outcome based. Yes. And I mean, this is a, we, we've heard the terms call in instead of call out. Yeah. When it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion. Yeah. Yes. And I think it's very <clears throat> effective as well for this type of, of conversation, as opposed to calling out and saying you're lazy or slow. Right. It's, just, it's to call in with the context. Yeah. This is who we need to be. Right. When we talk about some changes that we can do collectively, individually as a team to make it, make it so. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Love it. Love it. Um, and, and, you know, you can absolutely give people really um, tough feedback about how their behavior is impacting others and it can have consequences. I'm all for that. If that's the case, if what you're doing is, is actually trying to create change, um, you know, you're more likely to get it coming, allowing the person to kind of stay whole as opposed to evaluating them, judging them and, and causing that kind of defensive reaction.
Nice, nice. Um, I'm seeing a couple of things in the comment that I want to want to make sure we move to another thing that we promised on the okay. on the on the ticket here today. But one, I, I'm I'm seeing uh, the importance of not making assumptions. I think the, the the funny thing is is we can't not make assumptions. It's like, hey, Leanne, like, do me a favor. Don't bring your bias to this conversation. It's like, <laughs> uh, okay. I, I think, I think to, you know, I think what we need to do in these feedback conversations and in, in the in the vein of psychological safety is, this is the assumption I'm making up. Right. I'm not exactly. Saying it's fact. I'm not saying it's fact, but this is the the judgment or belief that I have. Right. Yeah, and I love Brittany Brown's language for this, right? Of like, this is the story I'm telling myself. It just seems. It, it seems more accessible, less edgy than some of the other language we might use. Like, here's the story I'm telling myself right now. And, and you know, really what you're saying is these are my assumptions or those sorts of things. It just sounds less um, prickly. Awesome. Awesome. So um, I have these direct reports that are with me 24 <laughs> seven. Um, I know you have some. Well, of you, these you, yours are direct reports. I, I call mine the bosses. Yeah, very good. <laughs> yeah. So we, we, we promise, I know in our pre-chat, <laughs> um, I, as we often do, we bring real stuff that's going on in our lives to our conversations. I brought up some stuff with, with parenting and raising our kids. I know your, your kids are now young adults and, uh, and mine are not, uh, mine are five and a half and two and a half. You're just really young adults. Yeah. Yes. Very young adults. And so we spoke about, I mean, psychological safety, again, it's not about being nice. It's about creating an environment in which in which all the conversations that need to have can in the guise of our growth. Um, and so I'd love to bring our last sort of 10 minutes of this conversation about psychological safety, healthy conflict uh, into how we can better do the best leadership job there is, which is parenting. Yeah, we we, we really suck. This, this generation of parents were really terrible. I'm, um, I'm worried. <laughs> I'm worried who you and I are going to inherit as clients like 15, 20 years from now that are so, uh, you know, that first category of psychological safety because they have been so protected from aversive experiences by their parents. And I see it all the time. Yeah. I have two, well, one is now in university, but I had two competitive dancers. If there is not a stranger space for like screwing with people's self-esteem, I remember a, a brand new parent whose daughter was competing in dance for the first time and we're backstage and her daughter got a high gold for her solo. And she was like, it's really, it's embarrassing to talk about it now. I'm embarrassed for her. She's in the change room telling all the moms, oh my goodness, my daughter got a high gold. She's on the phone. We can hear her telling everybody. She's posting it on Facebook. And it's like, who's going to tell her that high gold is beneath emerald, diamond, and platinum? That high gold is actually the most embarrassing uh, like score you can possibly get, but we have it so messed up that we don't want kids to get true feedback about what their performance was like, that we have high gold being the fourth highest level. <laughs> it's like, this is ridiculous. That's, that's, that's bad branding in and of it, itself it, right it there. Was, it was just terrible. So, yeah. um, just I, call I think it the tin foil. Is... then, then maybe we'll understand, right? <laughs> tin, I like tin foil and with yeah. the tin foil award. Yeah. Um, the worst one I ever saw in dancing, just because you have to laugh at this with me, there was one dance where dancing is is um, split up in competition between the type of dance, like modern or tap or jazz, and by the age group. And we were at this one competition where there was only one group in the category, but they actually have a rule that you have to get a gold to win the category. So they actually announced that this team came second in a category of one because they wouldn't give them a first. <laughs> Anyway, totally messed up. But if you go to that first base level of psychological safety, the problem is when we don't have confidence, um, when we actually make up our own risks. And if you have never let your kid experience aversive things, let them try hard things, take risks, feel discomfort, learn they can recover from it, then there's no hope of them climbing to the next level of dealing with aversive things because they've got conflict skills and they know how to stand up for themselves. And we have this huge generation. So you and I were talking about my favorite example of this, which is somehow the daycare thinks that on a Friday night, what I need more than anything else in the world is 73 pieces of construction paper with a two-year-old's paintbrush on it. And the daycare person has written my kid's name on it. And somehow 
all 73 pieces need to come home to my house and I'm supposed to do something with them other Picasso than Picasso Davy, them. right? Yeah, exactly. So this is the first time that we teach our kids to be precious, that we teach them if they touch a paintbrush to a piece of paper, that somehow that's fantastic and worth saving. And so um, my mom helped us with a really great strategy, which is she found this really great thing that hangs on the wall and it has nine pockets and you can just slide the construction paper into the pockets. And so we started the conversation. The papers would come home on a Friday and we would say, do you like any of these enough that we should replace one of the ones in the hanger? Because we got nine spots. And, and are you proud of this one? Oh, tell me why. What's it about? What, what, what do you feel when you look at this one? And which one do you want to take out? And let's maybe take a picture of it on our camera before we recycle it. Um, and it was really funny because I was talking about this in front of a live audience and somebody raised her hand and she got up to so proudly tell me that she does throw out her, her kids work, but only once they've gone to bed. And I was like, okay, that's not going to help. <laughs> We that's to, shielding yes we need to teach them that we have aversive experiences we can be uncomfortable and then they'll learn that they can recover from it it's okay it's all yeah. good and so much that's going on right now in our parenting strategies is about you know manufacturing their play dates um you know putting it out on facebook to make sure that enough people come to their birthday party like just all this stuff that we're doing to manufacture what we think will give them self-esteem but is actually kind of guaranteeing that there's no true self-esteem. We are the shields for our children. And so you've pretty much set yourself up to have to move to college with them, which I used to laugh at that until my daughter goes to McGill and I'm on a McGill parents Facebook page and no word of a lie. Last week, somebody posted a parent from the UK. We're considering, I'm considering moving to Montreal for the four years of my child's degree because I think it's hard for him to be away from home. Like, Wow. So that's where we're at. And so you and I are going to inherit, forget productive conflict 10 years from now, man. These, oh my God, I'm so I'm terrified. Business, I'm terrified. Is, business is looking good. Um, uh, <laughs> Tina, Tina sucks as a shield. Well, your kids can be very grateful <laughs> that you suck as a shield. Your <laughs> shields are permeable because then they'll actually have real self-confidence born of trials and risks and tests and all those things so that so self-esteem is not an outside in job you can't it give someone a trophy not. and then all of a sudden they have self-esteem that's artificial self-esteem is an inside out job that regardless of the trophy or not they feel good about who they are and they have value to bring boom especially because they've tried and failed and learned that i'm still loved unconditionally when i try and fail and then i can get back up and so that's the other thing you know, so many parents these days where grades and what school they go to and all this stuff is the big deal. Well, then the kids will actually tell you, I was so frightened that I wasn't going to get into the right university. And, you know, I was worried you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to tell your friends where I was going to school. I was worried you wouldn't be proud of me. No, crap, total crap. Like, I love you unconditionally. Now go out and try hard things, fail. I'll sit with you while you dust yourself off. But oh my goodness, we think we can build self-esteem for them and it's ugly. Yeah. It's interesting because you know, so my my kids, again, my eldest is five and a half. So she'll be done high school in 13 years. And my yeah, yeah, yeah. can't wait, can't wait. Uh uh, and then my my wife who's 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 highly educated, you know, conservative, is is already talking about college and your in university and i'm like if that's still a thing yeah, is that even gonna be a thing like if it's like, of oh, value yes. then i care more about her being kind and pursuing passions if that lends to college university whatever it might be great if we think as though she will grow or she wants to like cool but like uh, yeah. like happy to invest in her uh her resp which is an investment tool here in canada for education but like uh, like who knows yeah, exactly. And, yeah. you know, she might use it for pottery classes or a welding apprenticeship, like all good. Yeah, because uh, we just don't know. But, you know, we have such a, you know, such a 
bias toward, you know, kids thinking that life is this steady upward to the right trajectory. And it's not sure wasn't for me, like the absolute best thing that ever happened to me after coming out of high school as a total nerd kid was I belly flopped first year calculus, like belly flopped it, like got 25% or something. And it was one of the most important moments in my life. I'm like, oh, that was when the growth mindset kicked in. It was like, oh, apparently I'm not smart enough to pass first year university theoretical calculus without studying. Oh, <laughs> and it was a moment when I had to decide what, what do I want to do? And I took the same freaking course again the next year. And just to make it worse, it went from being 8.30 four times a week to 8 a.m. four times a week in university in second year. But Boy, was it ever good for me. I got a 75, which was the proudest mark I ever got because it was like, okay, I belly flopped that same freaking prof, 8 a.m., four days a week the next year. And that 75 was what I needed. But we're so obsessed with perfection and A's and we're, ugh, not healthy. Yeah. And I think a lot of the kids of our generation look at us and go, I don't want a life like you. You work nonstop. Why would I want that? Mm -hmm. So, Yeah. I think by the time your kids are at that stage, there's going to be a lot better options out there. Yeah, with a lot more harmony and integration into life, not just work. Yeah, exactly. Uh, love this. Uh, and I just have to share with that nine sleeves, uh, you know, I get, again, my, my kids, as young as they are, I get all of my culture from Peppa Pig. Oh, there was a, there stuff, was a Peppa, Peppa Pig. Pig episode that riffed on uh, Marie Kondo's uh uh so <laughs> there was this whole thing of of they were deciding whether to keep something or throw it out and mummy pig was asking does it bring you joy uh, <laughs> so i think this is a good a good standard yes, does this bring you enough your kids joy? Art. yeah yeah does this bring you enough joy little timmy or sally to keep the is, is this one of your nine slots yeah. otherwise it's going into the bin. That was the best, be it was a Christmas present. It was the best present my mother ever found for, for me and for the kids to, you know, make this conversation happen. It was really, really great. Wonderful. Leanne, I've been looking forward to this conversation for weeks. I'm so happy we've had it. Thank you everyone for the amazing comments and questions and engagement. Maybe just maybe we can coerce uh, Leanne to come back for another conversation uh, Anytime. Thank you for making this your uh, first, maybe only, or maybe certainly first appearance on LinkedIn since your uh, successful November campaign. Yeah, definitely uh, the first. And have have a lovely me -sember. Any <laughs> Any closing words or anything that you just want to leave us with? Uh, yeah, so I guess when I wrote The Good Fight, the, the message that became my sort of tagline was, even for a very conflict-averse person like me, some things are worth fighting for and mm -hmm. fighting for your kids' self-esteem, letting them have unpleasant, aversive experiences, fighting for a healthy team that's the team you deserve at work, all those sorts of things. Those things are all worth fighting for. And so a little discomfort goes a long way. And, and just ask yourself, am I in danger or just discomfort? Love that. Yeah, I've heard this notion of the fearless leader. No such thing. Leaders feel the fear and do it anyway because there's something worth fighting for. Love that. Love that. Leanne, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, whether live or on the recording. And we will see you again very soon. I'll be with Ron Tite next week. Oh, that'll be boring. One of uh, my favorite people. One, he's he's a funny guy. Uh, <laughs> looking How does one to crash it? a LinkedIn live? I need to yeah. <laughs> I need to crash that party. We'll give you we'll give you the uh, invite link. You can <laughs> you can come in. Awesome. Crash it. Thanks right. again, Leanne. Thanks, Thanks so everyone. much, everybody. Bye bye. Bye-bye.